Good morning. It's 7.03 a.m. in Washington, D.C. And welcome <clears throat> to Module 3, National Local Engagement in Countering Violent Extremism. In the last two weeks, um, <clears throat> we have discussed what community policing is and the challenges and opportunities to effective community policing in countering violent extremism. Uh, community policing, we have heard, is both an ethos and an organizational strategy that aims to promote a partnership-based collaborative effort between security actors and the community to ensure safety and security. At its best, community policing approach, I mean, deepens local ownership and foster trust between security actors local authorities and populations that have been marginalized or hard to reach. And this is particularly critical <clears throat> as the speakers have told us and, and we have discussed in our discussion groups in context of preventing and countering violent extremism where communities and security actors, they must have a clear understanding of the nature and source of the threat they are facing as well as have a clear understanding of the causes and dynamics of violent extremism. <clears throat> so in a countering uh, violent extremism context, the idea is that close trust-based cooperation between security actors and the communities they serve will result in reduced tensions and discontent and also it will result in an improved ability to intervene earlier in the cycles of radicalization and violent uh, extremism. As we have seen in the last two weeks, community policing is not a new concept in the continent in Africa. In fact, community policing is generally recognized as a critical aspect of the provision of effective community security. Yet, its adoption uh, has been slow. Its effective implementation has been lacking. You have heard in session one and again in session two, the many reasons why this is the case. And the most basic and obvious one is that community policing is hard work. It requires significant organizational transformation. It requires fundamental changes in policing cultures. It requires the inclusion of marginalized communities, marginalized voices. This in turn necessitates political will. It necessitates, you know, ongoing communication <clears throat> between all stakeholders. And none of this is easily achievable, particularly in conflict affected areas where security actors we see are under-resourced, you know, and they lack cultural ties to the community. So implementing a community policing approach to preventing and countering terrorism, you know, is, is a multi-faceted process that demands sincere engagement of communities in the problem solving process. Uh, we have heard that, you know, such engagements are long-term investments. It requ they require patience, they require consistent outreach and engagement efforts. You have heard the speakers, Jackie and Bogo last week, state that these efforts are more likely to yield genuine results if the outreach, you know, components by the police, law enforcement, security forces, reflect the racial, ethnic, and religious diversity of the communities they serve. Moreover, developing clear policies, <clears throat> you know, they need, we need to, to, to separate engagement work from intelligence collection efforts. And that's critical to build and maintain trust. It's critical to increase the effectiveness of security actors' engagement in counter and violent extremism. So, Community policing is not primarily concerned, you know, with cultivating informants from within the community. Uh, because gathering relevant information should only come as a byproduct of community policing. <clears throat> the good news is that we have heard good examples uh, 
we have heard examples of good practices by community policing that are worthy of further development and greater emphasis. You have heard the case of Tunisia. In post-revolutionary Tunisia, reform of the police and the security services you know, was necessary to, to, uh, uh, to transform the relationship between the state and citizens. Uh, key outputs in Tunisia included, as you have heard um, from uh, Faisal Bushrara, you know, include updated police standard operating procedures, training materials. The Ministry of Interior in Tunisia developed, and, and, and Mr. Bushrara talked about that piloted community policing model. So in Tunisia, democratization is creating more opportunities to strengthen national local linkages. You know, after holding its municipal elections in May 2018, the national government in Tunisia has been looking to newly empower municipal authorities to implement, uh, to develop first and then implement local counter and violent extremism projects that were linked <clears throat> to the implementation of the national uh, counter and violent extremism plan. So such efforts, you know, are still a work in progress and the extent of their success obviously depends on the sincere pursuit of security sector reform, you know, and of deepening of community partnerships. And this brings us to, the, to, the, uh, to today's session, national <clears throat> local engagement in counter and violent extremism. Uh, national <clears throat> local engagement, you know, is key to preventing a counter and violent extremism. It's critical as you will hear today as you will hear today, to the implementation of community policing, whose success depends on the support of different government agencies, you know, different security services, different frontline community practitioners. So city administration, administrators, municipal level practitioners, and other local authorities <clears throat> are generally more socio-culturally attuned to their community's attributes and dynamics. And this makes them, at least the assumption, better positioned to reach uh, conflict affected communities <clears throat> and facilitate interactions between and among uh, frontline security actors and communities. So, you know, in, in many cases, however, uh, local authorities and civil society organizations, you know, they play only marginal roles in national security issues. They rarely engage in the development of plans and strategies to prevent and counter violent extremism. And this tends to hamper government stated goals of expanding community oriented approaches to security problems at the local level. So top down approaches hinder security efforts tackle violent extremism. Uh, you know, weak communication and cooperation between frontline officers, their supervisors, and senior rank uh, affect the efficiency uh, and effectiveness of security, of the different security uh, uh, agencies. So to help us connect the dots on how to strengthen national <clears throat> local co uh, collaboration in addressing violent extremism, we will turn to two bright experts in the field. <clears throat> we have with us today uh, Dr. Nathaniel Allen, or Nate Allen, a colleague and a dear friend, and he's an assistant professor for security studies here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, and he's responsible for academic programming on cybersecurity peace support operations. It's also responsible on integrating these considerations into our center's research and outreach. We have also Munira Hamisi. Uh, <clears throat> she's a peace activist and community-based project officer. She's the director for the CVE and Community Engagement and Crime Office for the Mombasa governorates where she organizes community public participation in programs geared towards prevention and countering violent extremism. 
So let's start with Nate. <clears throat> Nate, um, from the empirical you know, literature on what makes for most effective you know, countering violent extremism responses. You know, what are some of the reasons that, that you have found of why strong national local cooperation between security actors seeking to engage local communities is important? You know, what are some of the obstacles you have, you have, you have come across to stronger national local cooperation in preventing and countering violent extremism? Nate, over to you. Thank you, Anwar, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, good morning from Washington, DC, and good afternoon to uh, everyone joining us from the continent. You know, in response to your question, Anwar, I would say most approaches to CVE in Africa are dominated by what I, by what I would call a state-centric or kind of top-down approach, as you, as you referred to earlier in which the idea is that extremist groups seek to take advantage of state weakness and ungoverned spaces, and that therefore, in order to effectively address or confront extremism, the state must reassert its authority. Uh, in many African countries, uh, national armies and police forces have a tendency, uh, particularly as extremists are beginning to establish themselves, to take on the burden of confronting extremism and marginalize local authorities in the process. And this often reflects not just the, the, the duties as they perceive it of national actors, but also the expectations of local and international uh, actors. Um, the problem with, with a top-down or state-centric approach, as I think we've, we've heard, is that it's really an oversimplification. It, it doesn't reflect what I would call a more contemporary view of what extremism is and, and how to confront it, which is extremism is both an, an individual level problem, a state level problem, and, and a, a communal level problem, a problem of, of state society uh, relationships um, in which extremists are taking advantage of, of, of problems in the social contract, of marginalized communities um, to provoke violence. Um, and that's why we have a kind of moved, uh, you know, especially at the regional level in the AU, towards a more uh, human security centric uh, approach to, to dealing with extremism and, and, and violence. Um, in the readings, uh, Ken Mankhouse makes quite clear that some of the failures of a, of a top-down or state-centric approach in the context of Somalia, where he argues that the billions of dollars of aid given to the government you know, over the past decade or so haven't prevented it from topping the list of Transparency International's most corrupt you know, due to problems not just with the government, but also with how kind of aid is given and distributed by the international community. Um, you know, the, the, the truth is, is that extremism is as much a regional level problem as it is uh, an, an, a national one. And hotbeds of extremism in Africa, northeastern Nigeria, and northern Mali, uh, historically eastern Libya, uh, northern Mozambique, they tend to be marginalized regions of African states often with histories of violent resistance uh, dating back to colonial and even pre-colonial uh, periods of time. Um, and you know, as we've learned, effectively dealing with extremism requires more than just a strong state. It requires more than just intelligence, which is also important. Um, it really requires community-led efforts to address extremism underlying causes. And this will be different from community to community. Um, as Lillian Dang makes clear in one of her, her readings, um, in, in Tanzania, a region like Morogoro, uh, the extremist risk is related to land and mineral conflict. In Zanzibar, it's contentious politics and youth unemployment. And national and, and local actors need each other both to understand these causes and address them. Um, and local engagement, support, and, and even leadership is, is absolutely critical. Um, but, you know, cooperation is also extremely difficult. And I think, too, two central challenges that we've heard before and I think we will continue to unpack today have to do with, first of all, um, local knowledge by national level security actors who are often kind of deployed to deal with extremist groups to regions which they are unfamiliar, in addition to all the problems with coordination and, and knowledge of local actors, and then kind of even more fundamentally trust, right? 
uh, national level actors often suspect with good justification, um, local actors of being sympathetic to extremist groups. And local actors are often mistrustful of national ones with some justification because their regions are politically and socially marginalized. So I'll leave it there. All right. Uh, th th thank you. You're absolutely right. I mean, even when <clears throat> when we know that local authorities, I mean, as, as you have stated, you know, they have a comparative advantage uh, in, in dealing with, with violent extremism. I mean, they're closer to, they often better understand the relevant groups and individuals. Uh, they are generally more practical, they are generally more nimble, they are generally less risk uh, you know, averse than their national counterparts. Uh, and yet, the role of local actors you know, has often been neglected, unfortunately, uh, by national actors. Local authorities, they often feel isolated, right? They often feel sidelined from discussions and decision making around national security issues. Uh, and, and more often than not, probably as we will hear, <clears throat> you know, local authorities, subnational authorities, they lack the mandate, they lack the expertise, they lack the resources to develop and implement so these, uh, these programs. Uh, so, you know, consultation between uh, or cooperation between the national level, national governments and local authorities, unfortunately, is, you know, has been the exception uh, rather than, <clears throat> than the than the rule. And this, Nate, leads me to the, you know, to the second question. Uh, so based on your expertise, uh, can, you, can you just walk us through the different models, you know, of national local division of labor between security actors and what this means for any of them relating to communities? Nate? Yeah, absolutely, Anwar. So I would characterize the existence of, of maybe three broad models. No absolutes here, but, but three very general models. One, you have uh, a predominant approach, a, a top-down state-centric approach. And the problem, as I discussed earlier, is that you know, the state taking on too much authority, national level actors taking on too much authority, is that you exacerbate knowledge and trust deficits and kind of risk making the problem of extremism worse by marginalizing local authorities and actors. Um, as an example of this approach, I often think of uh, the Nigerian approach to kind of dealing with Boko Haram in the early days uh, of the insurgency between 2012 and 2013, when a national emergency was declared, the military was deployed, deployed to the Northeast, and in part by being deployed to regions and localities in which it was unfamiliar, um, exacerbated uh, the problem. Um, one of the worst uh, human rights abuses that occurred during, during the conflict was when around 10,000 uh, members of, of the community of Giwa were, who were suspected of being affiliated with Boko Haram were detained in a barracks meant for 300 people. And I suspect that that decision uh, was due in part to detain them was due in part to these kinds of local knowledge and trust deficits. They did not have enough of an understanding of the local community to be able to know who was supportive of Boko Haram and who wasn't and how to kind of address some of the underlying causes of, of the support. Um, but, but it's also possible uh, to have an approach that gives too much authority, is too hands off from a state perspective. And or as you said, you know, the, states, the state often has national authorities, often have resources, expertise, um, authorities that, that local actors lack. And those are also at times critical to effectively managing extremism. And it's possible, I think, to delegate too much, especially authority to local security actors. And if done poorly, you know, particularly to like ethnicity-based uh, paramilitary groups, this will exacerbate trust deficits, uh, threaten national authority, and, and risk um, escalating extremism and, and leading to other forms of violence. Uh, I think a good example of this is uh, Central Mali beginning in 2016, when, if, if some of you may recall, um, the authorities in Mali sanctioned the creation of, of Dozo-based militia groups, such as the Ghana Amasa group, to protect themselves from jihadist incursions. And at the time, it seemed like a pretty straightforward way to make common cause 
um, uh, against a, a joint enemy when, when the state was having significant challenges uh, confronting an insurgency in, in the North. Um, the problem is that, that these militia groups uh, then became primarily based on ethnicity um, and directly challenged state authority, started kind of using their authority to settle scores and conflicts that weren't directly related to uh, extremism. Um, and that the massacres that, that, the, that the Dana Masagu of predominantly Fulani populations in cities such as Kulogon and uh, Wogasagu uh, ended up eroding intercommunal trust and, and led to eventually state attempts to try to disband the group after sanctioning the creation in, in the first place. Um, so the, the, the third approach, and I think the, the one that, that's the most effective is some kind of middle ground um, where state forces cooperate with local ones, particularly when it comes to establishing trust with local communities, um, but don't cede extensive authority, don't sanction the creation of paramilitary, particularly ethnicity-based paramilitary groups. And they may provide some arms, but do not provide heavy weapons or extensive amounts of, of military training. Um, the, the Teso Arrow Boys mentioned in one of the readings, I think is an instructive example. And, and so is, I think, the formation of, the, of the, um, the Civilian Joint Task Force in Nigeria, which kind of formed directly in response to some of the issues both with state violence and with uh, insurgent violence and, and extremist violence in Northeastern Eastern Nigeria. Um, and, and the reason why the CJTF, I think, is particularly instructive is that it has a lot of the characteristics of some of the more effective approaches to national local cooperation. Um, the members tend to stay in their local communities. It is, there is a formal coordination mechanism kind of with state forces um, and they're lightly armed and they are not, the members aren't recruited and they're voluntary. They're not recruited on the basis of ethnicity um, or they tend not to be recruited on the basis of ethnicity or, 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 or um, other forms of, or other, other kind of demographic based uh, divisions. Thank you, Nate. Uh, you, you nicely delineated the, the three three models: uh, the state uh, heavy centric one, the, the two hands uh, 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 hands off approach, and and the middle ground. And, uh, and you rightly uh, uh, stated why the middle ground approach is <clears throat> is better at improving uh, you know coordination uh, between security actors. Uh, so, Nate, I mean, what happens, you talked about Nigeria, right? I mean, what happens when national level actors, they do not work well with each other, uh, obviously compounding efforts at the local level? So I'd say there are at least two reasons why national level actors don't work well together, which can compound local level efforts to address extremism. The first issue happens when you have an unclear division of labor and responsibility between uh, uh, national level actors. Um, I think in many African countries, Nigeria included, this is in part because both the military and the police tend to be controlled at a national level rather than at a subnational level. Um, in Nigeria, the police academy in Kano is modeled after the defense academy in Kaduna. And you know the police, like the military, are recruited on a quota system, <clears throat> state basis according to federal character. This has some advantages, but but one of the disadvantages is you have uh, is that appointments tend to become uh, politicized, resources become centralized, and security forces kind of across the board suffer in their ability to facilitate local cooperation and trust. You know, in, in Nigeria, ostensibly it's the police who are charged with responding to riots, protests, riots, and internal unrest. You know, and I think in part because they're nationalized, um, they haven't been particularly effective at doing so. And on the one hand, um, their authority oftentimes gets usurped or undermined by the formation of auto defense groups, such as the Odua People's Congress, the Bakasi Boys, and, and yes, the, the CJTF. Um, and then, which also at times in, in cases where, where um, uh, extremist violence or, or contentious violence becomes extreme, leads to the deployment of the military, right? Which is now deployed in, 30 out of 36 states and, and very overstretched. Um, a second issue, and I think an even more damaging issue happens when national level forces are politicized and, and recruitment or promotion is on the basis of ethnic or political affiliation rather than merit. Uh, this is an issue I, I care a lot about. It was the subject of my, my doctoral dissertation. Um, 
you know, the, the security forces of Nigeria, as with most African countries, have a long history of being politicized and used primarily as instruments of regime rather than citizen-centric security dating back to colonial rule. Um, the start of modern policing in Nigeria actually uh, began in 1861 when the British colonial government governor used a force of 25 Hausa men from, from the north to police the newly annexed Lagos in the south, which was at that time inhabited predominantly by members of the Yoruba uh, ethnic group predominantly. Um, here, here I would say that, that one thing that now kind of uh, over 150 years later that Nigeria actually has going for it is that particularly since democratization, um, its national level security institutions, both police and military, have recruitment systems in place that ensure a relatively even ethnic balance. Um, the problem though is, is that when you, when you get into like a context of like fighting a Boko Haram insurgency and these nationally representative forces are then sent and deployed on a local level where again, they lack local knowledge, lack understanding of the context. Um, there's some really interesting research that recently came out on, on kind of uh, Uganda that looked that, that basically showed pretty convincingly that the local population is actually much more likely to trust members of the police if they're co-ethnic, which means it's really, really important not just to have nationally representative security forces, but also security forces at a local level that are representative of the main kind of population groups that, that exist there. Um, and, you know, as we know, the problem of representation within national security forces is far worse in other African countries where, you know, ethnic or politically based stacking within the security forces is far more deliberate. Um, when security forces are recruited exclusively or principally from one ethnic group and then asked to police or conduct operations in areas where other ethnic groups are present or dominant, the result is often, if not always, horrific violence. We see a number of numerous examples of this in everything from kind of the Janjaweed militia groups in Sudan uh, to the Kamajors in Sierra Leone, which was the topic of, of one of the readings. Uh, okay, well, let's now, let, let's end with the, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> a positive note, is so, so to speak. I mean, are there any promising approaches here and lessons that, that you have learned to address these specific challenges that, that you nicely uh, uh, laid out? Uh, yeah, I, I think there are three key lessons, and I, I actually think particularly over the past decade or so, there's been a lot of learning, and there are a lot of positive examples that, that we can point to, and many of which we're trying to lift up in the process of this, uh, uh, this, this program. Um, so three key lessons are, number one, uh, trust underlies everything. Uh, the key is establishing uh, which actors the community trusts as a national authority and attempting to work closely with them. Um, number two, and, and part of doing that means looking to local actors um, as, as partners, not subordinates, and, and, and understanding that generally speaking, a more, lo local, o more local ownership is better than less. Um, the only way to defeat violent extremist groups is through sustained, continuous local presence and, and intimate local knowledge. Um, and national level authorities have neither the will uh, nor the capacity to, to obtain this kind of knowledge on their own. Um, so the most successful approaches are ones that um, and neither leave local actors completely to fend for themselves in confronting extremist groups, nor completely attempt to kind of co-opt existing local uh, uh, approaches to, to countering violent extremism into national structures. Um, usually what you have is some kind of formal coordination and planning mechanism with clear divisions of labor, responsibilities, information sharing, and, and joint planning and funding. Um, National governments often are responsible for setting strategic guidelines, suggesting best practices, um, putting in national strategies to prevent extremism in place, um, providing resources and technical assistance to local actors, and if needed, uh, conducting large-scale counter-terror or uh, counter-extremism operations. Um, local governments uh, adapt these strategic guidelines to their best practices and to their local contexts and lead, keyword here is lead, the implementation of community-oriented, multi-stakeholder approaches to number one, 
build trust between security forces and the local population. Number two, uh, address whatever uh, more upstream drivers of extremism there are in a particular community, trying to prevent kind of extremism uh, from being a problem in the first place. Um, and, and three, kind of prevent extremist groups from, from coming in. Um, I, I think, you know, Kenya, an example we're gonna unpack, I think further on in, in the program, is a, is a particularly good example with like a national level uh, countering violent extremism strategy and local level um, action, action plans. Um, uh, two kind of further lessons that I'd like to emphasize, which is one that while national forces can or and often are obliged to provide some degree of weapons and arms and to incorporate kind of national level, local level security forces into national ones to some degree, uh, I think experience pretty clearly dictates there usually isn't much of a need to go much beyond light weaponry. Um, and there is a compelling need to avoid the creation of powerful paramilitary forces that can rival state authorities. And to above all, I think avoid kind of ethnic or political uh, divisions within local level security forces. It's an important local level issue too, as well as a, a national one. Um, and then kind of finally, and I think we're gonna talk more about this in the, in the final session, um, local forces need to stay in their communities um, and they need to be mobilized and, and taken care of um, after the potential end of a, uh, when, when, when the extremist threat uh, goes away. So I, I think those are uh, some, some key lessons. Um, I think there are lots of positive examples and a lot of progress uh, to build on um, despite the unfortunate uh, continued kind of rising uh, extremist threat. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nate. Uh, <clears throat> these were excellent uh, uh, examples <clears throat> you mentioned, and uh, you know they make a neat transition to our second speaker. You mentioned Kenya. Uh, uh, you know, Kenya offers a, a pretty good example of, of, of some of the reasons why uh, strong national local cooperation between security actors seeking to, lo uh, to engage local communities is important. I mean, when, when you look at its newly reinvigorated uh, county security and intelligence committees, you know, I mean, they have led somewhat to a better relationship between the national and county government in security matters. I mean, these county uh, uh, security and intelligence committees, you know, when you look at their, their membership, uh, they have a core membership of the county police commanders, the county national intelligence service officer, the county criminal investigation officers. They have representation <clears throat> or representatives uh, from the Kenya Forestry Service, the Kenya Presidents, uh, Kenya Defense Forces, in addition to members like the county government, leaders of the uh, county peace forums. Uh, they have private sector representatives. They have NGOs. So why I mentioning this example, and it still needs work, obviously, I just, as I said recently, it was reinvigorated. <clears throat> uh, they provide space for dialogue. They provide sharing of experiences, and most importantly, they strengthen the relationship between the national government uh, and county governments, as well as the various departments of the national police service and the county police service with the community. So, you know, this makes uh, them proactive in their responses to the needs uh, of, of the communities. And that's why, you know, we have the pleasure here to have uh, Monira uh, Hamisi, uh, you know, uh, with us. So Monira, I mean, you know, strengthening national local cooperation around countering violent extremism involves overcoming a number of impediments, as you have heard uh, uh, nicely stated here by, by, uh, by Nate. Uh, I mean, you know, CT, countering violent extremism or counterterrorism is usually a national government concern. But much of the day to day of violent extremism, much of the day to day of radicalization occurs in local towns, right? It occurs in local neighborhoods. Yet we have heard 
you know, the, the challenges out there. So, but, but Kenya provides good examples. So let's start with some of the obstacles. You know, what other obstacles are there that, based on your experience, that local authorities face in engaging with national authorities in preventing and countering violent extremism efforts that involve community policing? Monira? Um, thank you, Anwar, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak about our practice as a county government. Um, to quickly answer your question, some of the challenges that we have as uh, local practitioners is the fact that um, terrorism is, um, is, is, a, is, is tentatively looked at a very critical security component. But for us is how do we give the prevention work a human face? And as a county government, um, ours is more of the prevention rather than the countering. The countering, the CT is for the KDF, the Kenya Defense Forces, uh, the state government and uh, you know, the military component. The challenges that we have been facing for the last um, five years or so, has been, of course, the resource component, um, coordinating uh, also the coordination aspect of how do you coordinate a multi-sectoral um, kind of membership, specifically if you look at our coordination mechanism. We have the CB County Engagement Forum that has membership like what you had said from various sectors, the academia, the business community, the community members themselves, the security sector as well. So uh, one, there has been the coordination aspect, which, um, which we are currently pursuing very well. Then of course, uh, trust issues. Um, terrorism currently uh, in the country, uh, you know, when, the, when you sit on a table, with the commanders, um, even if your government, their state government, your local government, there's, there's the aspect of, you know, terrorism is still a national security issues. And uh, most of the times we are not privy to critical information, for example, like um, how many returnees do we have in the county? Uh, what's, uh, what's the arena like uh, in Somalia, for example, with Al-Shabaab? So, um, the, the aspect of access to information for us as a local government has also been quite an issue. And of course, the component of resources to implement some of the programs that we have. All right, thank you. Governments, they, they should include local authorities and uh, you know, in the development of, of strategies to deal with terrorism. And they have to ensure that they have the authority and necessary resources. You talked here about the resource component. Uh, you talked about, you know, access. So there is a need to strengthen, you know, uh, to build, but also to strengthen existing structures and mechanisms, you know, between local, state, and national governments to ensure exactly what you talked about, uh, you know, better uh, and effective you know, communication, coordination, ability to have, to have access uh, to, to resources, to, to information. Um, so Monira, are there uh, any other, you know, or any cases of other African countries that have incorporated local actors in their community policing programs to prevent uh, and counter violent extremism that you have learned from? Uh, and if so, what are they? Yeah, as, um, as a local uh, government, we uh, take precedence uh, as one of the counties that develops the county action plan around the country. Uh, we've been having a lot of peer-to-peer -peer exchange learning between ourselves and uh, even countries around the world, for example. Um, as the co-founders of the Strong Cities Network, we've been having a city-to-city -city exchanges between the city of uh, Kristiansand in Norway and Mombasa County. And in Norway, um, they have the community policing aspect whereby uh, the community mothers 
uh, take charge of um, young people who are in conflict with law. So apart from just uh, the police uh, taking charge, we have community members who uh, take part in terms of mentorship, in terms of guiding the young people and driving them out of joining violent extremist organizations. Apart from the city of Christiansand in Norway, we've also learned a lot from our sister country in Tanzania, how they've been able to develop the Nyumbakumi Initiative, uh, which talks about community policing in the grassroots level, uh, how community members um, can be able to identify uh, foreigners in the community, how to report that, and also how uh, the, the various community policing committees that we have uh, in terms of compromisation of the members. How do you involve young people? How do you involve both county government, uh, national government, civil society organisation? So we've learned from quite a number of countries. The most recent one was uh, Abuja in Nigeria, uh, where they're currently developing their the NAP, the Nigerian Action Plan for CDE. And one of our takeaway points was how, what is the role of county governments or rather subnational governments in terms of the integration of foreign fighters um, or rather defectors who have, who want to come back. Um, and uh, this has informed our resilience policy uh, where um, we have a section on how do we reintegrate back our young people who who have disengaged, who have been disengaged, who have been disarmed by the NCTC, and now the county government takes up the role of social integration because social services is a devolved function of the government in Kenya. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Munira. These are excellent examples that uh, <clears throat> that you cited. And again, it just demonstrates the you know the comparative advantage that that uh, 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 that subnational stakeholders you know have when when implementing a range of of CVE efforts. I mean, from prevention to actually uh, to intervention to what you just talked about rehabilitation. Uh, and, uh, and 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 the reintegration. Uh, and Kenya offers a, a very good example. Obviously, more work needs to be done of how you know subnational authorities can catalyze uh, improved national local cooperation around uh, countering violent extremism. Uh, you talked about uh, Mombasa, in fact, a member of county governments, right, in, in Kenya. Uh, together with local civil society organizations, you know, they have developed subnational uh, CVE plans, counter violent extremism plans, and they attempted that you know to make these plans reflect uh, local priorities. Obviously, this plan, the 2015 plan, was uh, criticized for not you know capturing the concerns and priorities of local communities, and it had to be updated, right, to reflect uh, local advice. But that's the the goal here, that iterative mode. Um, so, you know, we have been engaged in, in, in the Mombasa uh, County Government Action Plan. Uh, uh, so Munira, has, has this CVE Action Plan actually improved local and national cooperation? Uh, has it been used to inform national level policies and approaches, Munira? Well, yes, um, as the one of the first counties to develop the county action plans, we call them the first generation caps. Uh, yes, we received a lot of criticism. Uh, but then again, it is quite important to understand that the strategy was informed by the community members themselves. It is not what Munira wants. It is not what the national counterterrorism wants. It is what the people want. And when you're, when you're conducting uh, prevention work, you, you have to be in synergy with, with what the community um, is telling you. 
So for us as a county, um, we are refreshing the county action plan. Uh, we are currently in plans of refreshing the CAP in the next two weeks and basically looking at what has worked for the last um, three years or less, what has not worked, how do we improve? We understand that we have new um, recruitment uh, to VEO trends that are currently happening in the county. How do we counter that? How do we improve our ME system? So it's a learning curve for everyone. And um, we are looking at uh, refreshing the CAP. Has the, has the CAP improved uh, national and local cooperation? Yes, it has. Um, for quite some time, you could not have the state government, the local government, and civil society organizations sitting on one platform and coordinating prevention work. So yes, the CAPs have worked. And um, you can even see the number of um, recruitments have gone down from the time the CAP was launched to where we are right now. As a county, our radical index is stable. Um, we are looking at uh, very, very low numbers of our young people joining extremist organizations because of the multi-agency uh, approaches that each partner is implementing according to the CAP. 